Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals. My guest today is Aaron Vansingen. He is a co-author of a new book coming out from Verso Books, The Future is Degrowth, A Guide to a World Beyond Capitalism. Um, he's the co-author with Matthias Schmelzer and Andrea Vetter. Um, so, degrowth. It's a concept that is somewhat controversial, somewhat misunderstood, I think, because there are a lot of things we talk about when we mean growth. Um, both, you know, GDP, gross domestic product growth in the economy, but also the, you know, ecological growth or the material growth and like how much stuff we use, how much energy we use. Um, degrowth then is also misunderstood because it's not only saying no to growth, um, which by itself might sound dangerous or like you're asking people to live in poverty, um, but it's also putting forward something of an alternative, um, Aaron helps us walk us through these complexities, responds to some of the common objections to degrowth, and talks about, you know, the positive vision of degrowth as well. It's a nice follow-up episode to those of you who listened to um, my interview with Kate Soper a few weeks ago about her book, Post-Growth Living, Toward an Alternative Hedonism. Um, but of course, if you didn't listen to that, you can listen to this one too. Um, and also, uh, Aaron happens to be a co-editor of Not Afraid of the Ruins, which is a collection of speculative eco-fiction. Uh, and I, I interviewed one of the other editors, um, Dylan Harris, a few weeks ago as well. Um, so I, I asked him briefly about, um, you know, the role of fiction in responding to ecological crisis toward the end of the interview. Um, but it's mainly about the new book, The Future is Degrowth, A Guide to a World Beyond Capitalism. Um, it comes out Tuesday, June 28th, which for many of you, is the day that this podcast is released. Um, okay, quick, you know, housekeeping stuff before we get started with the interview. As always, you can keep up with the podcast on Twitter. I'm at Dayton R. Martin D. <laughs> it's not my full last name. Uh, the link is in the episode description. Uh, you can like Storytelling Animals on Facebook. Um, if you really want to, you know, make sure you get each new episode in your inbox, I have a weekly newsletter where I share you know, podcast related updates, um, the a link to the best article I read each week, as well as, um, updates on the book club that I host as, as part of this podcast. Um, if you sign up for the newsletter, you can attend a book club episode, uh, as a, as a free trial. If you want to be more permanently part of the book club, you can, um, support, uh, this podcast on Patreon at the Lorax tier or higher. Um, there are other perks and stuff at different levels of Patreon support, patreon.com slash storytelling pod please um, consider pitching in um, to help me out and help this podcast out. Our next month's book club book, by the way, is The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. He's a previous podcast guest, and this is uh, his attempt, a novel that's his attempt to imagine kind of the next several decades of humanity's response to climate change. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in there. You know, humanity responds in a lot of different ways um, in his book, some of which are more admirable, some of which perhaps aren't. Um, and it's, there's a lot to discuss and I'm excited to discuss it with, um, the book club members and hopefully you will consider becoming one of them. All right. Without further ado, here's Aaron Vansigen, uh, about the future is degrowth. Hi, I'm here with Aaron Vansigen, uh, author of future is degrowth a guide to a world beyond capitalism um aaron thanks so much for coming on the show thank you for inviting me yeah so um you are one of three authors of this book uh so first before we kind of get into more into detail i wanted to ask just how this book uh came together yeah well um andrea and matthias had actually written a version of this book in german which was published in 2019 um and then they got the chance to uh, do a um, uh, publish it with Verso. Um, and so they reached out to me to ask if I could help with this new version, which would be kind of new and improved, um, more, even more contemporary and kind of changed for an English audience. Cool. Um... And yeah, that uh, starts to answer, I think, my second question, which is that there are a, a kind of a, a wave of of new books um, either related to degrowth or at least degrowth adjacent. So what 
what particular niche are you is this book trying to fill so yeah there, there's a f- quite a few books um there's um some lean towards the more academic and others lean um like jason hickel and then um anitra nelson and um the other author um his name is escaping me exploring degrowth uh, they they put out these books that were maybe for a more mainstream audience. And I would say that our book is really a, a book that is for um, a progressive socialist um, left. Okay. So, and um, really specifically is meant to engage with some of these um, more detailed questions about degrowth, and capitalism, colonialism, um, patriarchy, and 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 really kind of start from a perspective critical of all those things. Cool. Um, so maybe before we get too far into this, um, I think there's some confusion out there about what degrowth is actually about, what it means, um, and it's more complicated than just opposing economic growth, although that's part of it. Um, and obviously, you'll you'll be able to refine the details as we go on in the interview. But just kind of briefly, what's your sort of elevator pitch for what does degrowth entail? So the word degrowth is just a word. Um, and it's a word that generates a lot of confusion. And in a way, that's kind of the point, um, because mm-hmm. it's a way... In, in, in my opinion, to have some discussions about things that we haven't really talked enough about. Um, specifically, it's about um, the need to politicize um, what we call the social metabolisms of society. So it's the amount of stuff and energy that an economy kind of um, goes through and transforms from nature into goods and into waste. Um, and that that itself uh, ought to be a political issue. Um, mm. So that's that's one thing. Um, and the other, I would say, is that degrowth is also about challenging uh, a hegemonic um, or, or an ideology of how an economy works and what an economy should look like um, and creating space for alternative kinds of ways of, of living and, um, and, and thinking about uh, how a society could work. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things you do in the book is before you get, um, you know, too much in the weeds of what, a degrowth society will look like. Um, You have a chapter that is more about defining economic growth. um, And you talked about kind of this, um, you know, hegemonic dominant idea we have of what a healthy economy looks like it grows. Um, And one of the things that really stood out to me in the book is that this idea of the economy needing constant growth and that growing, you know, the GDP, the gross domestic project product is, you know, what it means to have a successful economy, that's actually more recent than I think I would have thought or a lot of people would have thought. So when and how did we become so growth oriented? Yeah, so you could say that it kind of first started with, um, well, even the word economy was not used in the way that we use it now as a a thing. It was more like there is an economy of something um, but it, we didn't even use that word to describe um, a society, like a market or a society, um, since uh, only since the 20th century. And then economic growth is even newer and really only came about in the late 40s, 50s. Before that, the health of, of whether society was doing well was often calculated like in terms of maybe unemployment. Um, but only later, after the Second World War, was there this concern um, about wh- how do we measure whether we're doing well or not? And interestingly enough, economists 
um, came up with this model of, of measurement at, at the time called gross national product and now gross domestic product, GDP. And the ones who came up with it immediately rejected it as like, this shouldn't be a yardstick for anything because it's kind of a, fa a false um, way of quantifying um, anything at all. But um, kind of the political establishment ran with it. And so this really has to be understood as in the context of, um, you know, you have the New Deal, um, you have the post-war reconstruction of Europe, you have the increasing um, prom um, st growing strength of, of the USSR and, and the communist threat. And so th there needed to be a way to measure by the establishment to measure um, capitalism's success against uh, communism and also as a way to kind of appease the working class saying, look, um, we, you can have the things you want, but first we have to grow as a nation. First, we need to um, achieve uh, these measurements and only then um, can we start redistributing things. Um, so it was always a way to kind of push back and, and, um, and kind of delay uh the cutting of the pie and then at the same time it became this uh kind of global part of a global uh competition between you know the first and second world of of the capitalist and the communist worlds um of is are these economies better are these economies doing well um how can we measure which one is actually a achieving better uh levels of production and and wealth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah as you mentioned it's gdp is not necessarily a, a good measure of you know whether people are actually happy or satisfied or flourishing but it's the measure that was useful um geopolitically at that time and domestically um but then the other part of growth that you mention is that it's not just about numbers on a spreadsheet, but actual energy and physical stuff required to power the economy. Um, can you talk more about this aspect of growth? Yeah, absolutely. So we start that chapter by saying, listen, here's a, here's a history that a lot of people don't know about. It's the, it's, we, we kind of go back and say, look, like this term growth is extremely new and we never even used to think about um, about our society in this way. Um, but at, at the same time, you can still go back and, and take a material perspective. And actually, if you actually un look at a society um, or an e economic system like ours, uh, it does have a material, uh, incredibly uh, uh, productive and, and accelerating um, material side. And, and so we call that kind of the material part, uh, aspect of growth, where um, you can really see how over time, um, increasingly over the last decades, just um, the use of all these different products has increased um, exponentially and um, is leading to what people call the planetary boundaries of, you know, you have uh, the, uh, not just the amount of oil, let's say that's available or f phosphates that are available or, um, you know, nitrogen that we can use uh, in the soil, but also the amount of waste that that causes. And at a certain point that waste causes system collapse um, as well, like we see with uh, climate change. So, those are these kinds of, you have this material side of a growth economy that just as this ideology was developing at the same time to, to legitimate um, a, a growing economy, um, you also have this massive, massive throughput of energy and material um, products that we call social metabolism and, and that ecological economists call social metabolism. Mm -hmm. and th there's a graph in that section that 
um, you took from a paper that I'll link it in the episode description. I forget who who did it, but just that the the total stuff that um, human economies and societies are creating, you know, stuff like concrete, asphalt, bricks, um, in aggregate now it weighs about as much or more as uh, the non-water mass of all living things, um, which, I don't know, it was <laughs> extremely striking to me that, uh, yeah, we're, we're just producing so much and that stuff we produce is coming from, you know, be it sand or minerals or, or other things that we're extracting from, from the earth. And it, it's, it's, we're taking it from somewhere and it's going somewhere, which I think is, is something that, um, degrowth is, is helpful at, at, uh, asking people to, to pay attention to. Um, so you, you have a number of critiques, kind of ways of critiquing growth in the book. Um, there's seven. If you want to, you know, if you want to read in detail in all seven, the book is called The Futures to Growth. It's from Verso. Um, but I maybe we'll get through a couple here. Um, and first, I want to ask you how you came to degrowth. Um, you know, were, have you always been skeptical of growth? And, and what are the arguments for degrowth that first really started to appeal to you? Um, yeah, I mean, so my my family background is that my my parents worked in the um in like uh international development and uh, humanitarian aid sector um so this kind of language i i really grew up with it um it was like the 90s the clinton era um everything seemed very well and uh you know kind of like just an era of progress and it's just all going really well. Um, I think things started kind of seeming a bit weird to me when I, I was working in a food bank um, and uh, doing research there as well. And I was researching kind of the history of how food banks came about. And, you know, you have at the same time uh, the welfare state, which retreated, and then the massive food tr retail industry, which started offloading its waste, which it necessarily produces onto society at, as a form of charity. And this just seemed like a colossal, like a colossally irrational way of doing things. <laughs> um, and, and that's actually around the same time when I uh, started learning about degrowth. Um, so okay. I, I approached it from uh, this kind of ecological economics perspective that that was my training and my master's degree. Um, and and then I started kind of engaging with it on a more diverse level. Um, so my partner moved to Barcelona to do a master's and I moved with them um, as I was trying to like figure out what I was going to do next. And I joined this degrowth reading group in Barcelona and yeah, things just kind of went from there. So yeah, I'm going to ask what is maybe one of the co most common questions you get, which is, um, okay. So we talked about all the, these materials and all this energy that it currently takes to grow GDP. Um, I'm going to ask the question in two parts. Part one is, can't we just figure out a way to keep growing the economy, but without all those materials and energy? Um, and then part two of the question is, even if we can't, what if we, you know, if we recycle better and use renewable energy, like, can't we grow the materials and energy that we use without that being harmful to the environment and the, the people who depend on it or are all of us? Mm. So I would say that maybe the first question is more of a um, it's it's more of a question of um, theory versus practice, and then the second is maybe like more one that is you know is more of a third thermodynamics question, and I I can kind of okay. go through that. Um, so you know you can theoretically 
create a system where um, even if the current system is highly material and resource and energy intensive, you could theoretically make it so that as you start relying on a less um, highly, uh, you know, carbon emitting uh, sources of energy, um, you could continue to have GDP growth. Um, and there's a lot of people who have tried to show that this is happening and possible. Um, and that gets into this question of what people call decoupling. Can you decouple energy from GDP growth? Um, and in general, the um, there's two sides of the debate. Um, one is that there is evidence that this kind of decoupling has happened in specific times, peri time periods, uh, and places. Um, and then the degrowth position is that um, the overwhelming evidence shows that um, this is that GDP and energy use are so. Um, Couple or GDP and uh, carbon emissions are so coupled that uh, this would be very hard to do, though theoretically still possible. Mm -hmm. But um, all the evidence that there is that whatever decoupling has happened is just not enough to show that it um, is happening at the rate and globally enough. Um, so it's a, that's a very technical question. Um, can we keep growing without using all this material and energy? Um, I mean, it just, the, the evidence shows that there is a really high likelihood that they're so tied together. Um, like it's almost a one to one ratio, um, that you have even if it were possible, you have to act like it's not possible. Um, like we have to acknowledge that maybe we need to uh, transform an economic system so that it does not depend on economic growth, but could be agnostic about it or could um, like function very well without constantly having to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question, uh, this is a question that has been like, um, really is more of a, from coming from the history of um, ecological economics is, can, can we just recycle everything efficiently enough um, so that it doesn't really, so that we just keep re reusing the same thing? Um, the problem is like, let's say you, you try to recycle all the plastic you have every time you you recycle, you're using energy, and then you're using um, energy and material to build the recycling power plants. But you've actually then downgraded the plastic to a mm -hmm. less usable um, format. So you're always putting in more energy the more you recycle. And uh, you're also having to create more material infrastructure. And in the end, you're still left with a product that you then can't reuse. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, um, we have to, for most things that society depends on, we don't actually have a lot of, um, low energy ways to recycle them. Um, so like this idea of a circular economy, it works for like a very small amount of materials that we use, but ultimately we actually need to reduce the amount of materials um, because otherwise you're always just putting more exponentially more energy into the system mm -hmm. and, and each time you put energy into the system you get it's you lose energy like you lose because um, you don't have perfectly efficient systems right so one of the things you said earlier is that this book is sort of coming at degrowth from a perspective that um, is, you know, critical of, of patriarchy, of imperialism, um, and of capitalism. So I want to start with, um, capitalism because, uh, 
I think, you know, capitalism predates GDP. Um, so is, is degrowth necessarily critical of capitalism? Uh, is degrowth, are, you know, are, are degrowth advocates automatically socialist or at least compatible with that? Um, and kind of what, what is, what do degrowth economics look like in relation to sort of capitalism, socialism debates? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I would start by saying that, like, so degrowth could be considered more of a kind of academic field and movement. And in a way, what we were doing with our book was both reporting on that movement and kind of placing kind of, uh, you know, like orienting the rudder in a way that we think could lead towards a more like eco-socialist perspective of degrowth. Um, but that means that there's also a huge, huge diversity of perspectives in degrowth. Mm -hmm. And I would acknowledge that not all of them, though the majority, vast majority is not all of them are critical of capitalism. Um, and I wouldn't, though I think most people in Involved could be convinced that really what they're talking about is socialism. Um, a lot of people wouldn't place themselves in that um, um, mm -hmm. kind of perspective. And um, I would also say that a lot of uh, the kind of beginnings of the degrowth movement and, and still today are very much on the like more... Um, anarchist side of things. Um, so more about like bottom up grassroots um, organizing and, um, and uh, kind of principles of non hierarchy and decentralization of power um, really run deep in the degrowth movement. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, you mentioned earlier that you know U.S. competition with the Soviet Soviet Union in the 1900s. It's not like the, if you want to call it state socialism or communism or whatever of of the USSR was was great for the environment or anti growth or anything. Um, so so you so yeah, then maybe that sort of more bottom up perspective is is really necessary. Um, you said that a lot of. Um, you said that a lot of degrowth people could be convinced that what they're talking about is socialism. What is the socialistic aspect of, of degrowth? It's a good question. I, I think um, it, it's hard to say because, you know, as, as I guess you might have seen in the book, like it's such a diverse mm -hmm. um, set of perspectives that we try to distill in some commonalities. Um, but I would say that by and large, um, it shares with socialism a analysis and a strategy um, and and a kind of where we want to go. Um, so just going through that, the analysis being one that's largely um, understanding and critical of, of capitalism and its drive for accumulation. Um, the strategy being one that, you know, you, you would see a lot in, in the kind of socialist, um, organizing is, is a strategy that's like multi-pronged one around people power and one around like pushing for policies that would make socialist forms easier, um, so kind of like inside, outside the state. Mm -hmm. um, and then where we want to go, I would say that, you know, that is very much in line with communism. However, um, going to your point about, you know, the USSR and growth in the USSR, I think um, degrowth perspectives on, you know, what would a society look like um is definitely one that's critical of like productivism um as like the engine itself of well-being um so I, I guess i don't know like if uh people like like think more like 
William Morris's News from Nowhere, where he imagines this kind of lazy, relaxed, crafty socialism versus like the images of 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 Soviet socialism of of um, you know mm -hmm. massive factories, um, just intense production um, without much um, concern for. Uh, environmental or or uh issues of of hierarchy and uh the type of uh which, which really was i mean it's such an interesting question but like it it really has a degrowth has a similar vision to communism i would say um but then you have to say which vision for communism mm -hmm. Uh, people kind of interested in, in some of these questions might enjoy uh, an interview I did a few weeks ago with um, a philosopher named Kate Soper, who wrote a book called Post Growth Living. But kind of we talked about this idea of, you know, a a post capitalist world where you work less and maybe you don't consume as much, but you have more leisure time and, and kind of do you know non consumptive activities and social, you know, you, pe goods items are shared instead of individually owned um, rather than, you know, a factory making, you know, infinite goods and cars and whatever else that are all individually owned, but at least it's, you know, the factory's worker owned. That's not enough by itself. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think one of the other, um, maybe before we we get into uh, both some objections to degrowth uh, some, and also what the degrowth sort of movement and policies might look like. I want to ask about specifically the, the feminist critique of growth that's raised in the book, just because that's something that um, I found interesting and, and useful. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess like the, um, the idea is that what's included in growth in the GDP is a is kind of a very specific selection of what counts as contributing to the economy and what counts as doesn't, and it tends to value, um, you know, a certain type of work that's traditionally been men's labor, even though obviously it's it's less exclusively so now. Um, but what it doesn't value is what is still disproportionately women's work. You know, quote unquote, is you know care work and caring for you know, childcare and elderly and things that are super valuable for actually keeping society running, um, but don't necessarily make the boss as much money. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are the, um, I guess, what are the implications of that critique for, for what degrowth is advocating? Like wh what can degrowth do to, to help fix some of that? Yeah. So I would the feminist, critique is is completely fundamental to degrowth and you can also see this in the history of degrowth where it really like shaped sharpened its own kind of analysis through a lot of these uh, feminist economists who were um making making these points and and kind of uh were responding to the lack of engagement with um with uh like the need to look at the economy from a feminist from a feminist perspective um both in mainstream economics but also in marxist and and left-wing economic theory um and a, a lot of the original impetus for degrowth came from those thinkers so um yeah, you could say like Carolyn Merchant or um, Silvia Federici, Maria Mies. Um, they kind of provided a understanding of capitalism as first, uh, well, rooted in in colonialism and in uh, the oppression of of women, and then also the create the creation of binaries, the enforcement of binaries between different kinds of work. So, um, and the valuation of that. So production um, versus reproduction or, or kind of labor versus care. Um, 
which which kind of mapped onto these binaries of man, women, uh, humanity, nature, um, where one was more valuable and uh, uh, more powerful um, and more necessary than the other. So it, it, for degrowth, that we argue has to be at the center of the analysis, but also at the center of the proposals that degrowth involves. So like we talk about a, an, a care economy where it's an economy where um, care is, is shared and valued. And it's not just that like uh, women are compensated for work that they do, but that the binary of what work is valuable or not is is completely restructured um and that necessarily involves like really challenging um the roots of of how we think of the economy and also how we um yeah like it challenges capitalist accumulation because if you start um, orienting an economy towards, um, like, you know, uh, supporting child, child care or elderly care or um, around uh, household food production um, or even around just like maintaining and caring for infrastructures that exist rather than constantly having to build like bigger, newer better infrastructure um you, you you start having a very different like uh well like a, a very different way of of living um where the basic things are a lot more accessible for everybody um but also it actually frees up um people who are often forced into care work um by sharing it and distributing it. And just because we've mentioned it a couple times, um, for maybe the less uh, Mark's familiar uh, listeners, when we talk about capitalist accumulation, what specifically are, are we talking about there? Yeah, so we we could talk about um, kind of the global market that exists, which allows trade to happen with very little like resistance. So. Like, let's say I um, make $1,000 and then I can invest that $1,000 into a palm oil plantation and then make uh, in, sell it five years from now. And then I've, I have $2,000 because of um, like the increased value that that had. Mm -hmm. But I made, it, I made it on my, just very simply on my job and someone else uh, is managing the palm oil, cutting down the rainforest in Indonesia. Um, but what I've done allows for that to happen. So like on a broad scale, capitalist accumulation is this kind of like effortless market that has very little resistance and can, can kind of go in anywhere and accumulate. And the accumulation is always for its own sake, kind of. It's just for more accumulation. Um, cool. So, yes, it makes sense that a proposal called degrowth would not be supportive of just accumulating for its own sake. Um, so one of the, uh, I think, concerns people have about degrowth is, uh, yeah, it's all well and good for rich people in rich countries to, um, you know, consume less, use less energy, um, but... For even within wealthier countries, don't the poor people there, you know, need more? Um, and then especially in in poorer countries and the global south, you know, isn't shouldn't we want them to grow their economies more and not shrink them? Um, but but in your book, you sort of talk about that actually one of the strongest arguments for degrowth is looking at um, kind of global north, global south inequality. Um, so so yeah what, what kind of what's your response to that concern um yeah so the response is multi-pronged um one is that of course degrowth is not talking about how um 
poor people should also have less, even poor people in rich countries, or that um, people don't deserve uh, a life of uh, well-being and, and flourishing. Um, what degrowth is actually proposing is, is what we call in the book public abundance. It's um, where if you actually are able to share a lot of goods that people do need, um, you can create a system that is um, actually feels very fulfilling and abundant, but it wouldn't necessarily require as much material and energy throughput. Um, it wouldn't also be bent on always growing and then crisis, as we're seeing now, this kind of constant cycle of being on a treadmill, falling over and and then having to, you know, make more austerity cuts. Um, degrowth is actually the opposite of that. It's creating an economy where we actually can provide for everybody and um, it doesn't, it, things aren't privatized. So things are shared amongst people in a kind of public um, abundant way. Um, however, um, at the same time, um, degrowth argues against um, a kind of, as we talked about this ideology of growth. Um, so when I talked about how growth began and, and kind of came to be in the 1940s, starting in, in the late 60s and 70s, as um, kind of the concern shifted from communist Europe to global development, growth became used as a kind of uh, measuring stick, but also as, as a way to force um, global South countries, um, so poor, poor countries to make cuts in their programs so that they could in their in their state programs and um, so that they could better uh, uh, achieve economic growth was the argument. Um, so I'd say that poor countries, though we are uh, told that growth is good and necessary for poor countries by and large, the history of decolonialism is that poor countries uh, gained independence and then were forced into the system of growth through what they call structural adjustment, which is basically a, a code term for, uh, we privatize all of your resources and take as many of them while giving you mm -hmm. loans to supposedly develop, but which actually puts you in debt forever. Um, so like we have to acknowledge that growth as an ideology wasn't just harmful for the Western working class by like um, kind of sedating them into accepting the economic system, but was also really harmful for the global South, for people living in poor countries, um, especially in the third world as they had their decolonial movements. And then I, I would say that there's kind of like a third part to that argument. So you have degrowth as proposing a public abundance, then growth as an ideology, but also there's kind of this um, idea that, just the idea that if, if, you, if an economy grows, that everyone gets a share um, and that it's impossible to think of an economy that doesn't depend on that um, is just, people talk about degrowth as being a, a missile concept kind of launched at the hegemony of growth where, I mean, it's a very warlike metaphor, but I think it, it really, it's, it's just trying to, trying to break that spell and trying to encourage different ways of, of thinking about what prosperity could look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the, knee-jerk reactions people might have is oh you're trying to you know end growth that's going to result in privation or austerity and that is what happens in under capitalism when there are when there's unplanned you know collapses in growth a recession or a depression um that does end up being very bad for people um but a distinction that you really stress in the book is that this is importantly different from um 
you know, it, a an unplanned recession is importantly different than, you know, a positive degrowth program in which that, you know, GDP reduction is is something that's both like intentional and democratically managed as opposed to being kind of out of our control. So why is this distinction so important? And maybe here we can start kind of thinking more about solutions. What are like, what are ways to start moving toward a more democratic management of, of where the economy goes? Yeah. Um, yeah. So like a frame that, um, a, 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 a phrase that people use is we, we talk about degrowth so that um, no more crises happen again. Like hmm. um, capitalism is, you know, it seems like every 10 years, like we had one in 2008. Now we're due for another one. We have another crisis. We had the early nineties, then, you know, the, the OPEC crisis, like it's just this constant cycle of, of crisis and degrowth is about how can we create an economy that doesn't depend on, on that kind of destruction of wealth, mm -hmm. which affects the poor the most, which then also results in, in new opportunities for profit and, and for investment. Um, how, how can we kind of decouple um, not growth from material or energy use, but how can we decouple GDP from well-being? How can we have uh, uh, an economy that promotes uh, prosperity without having to depend on, on this system, which is constantly uh, kind of like uh, collapsing around us um, again and again? And yeah, so we're talking about a planned, uh, a planned downscaling versus an unplanned crisis and collapse. Um, and in in degrowth, there's kind of these proposals for what would a planned uh, transition look like. Um, it's it's kind of like pointing out that uh, social metabolism has its political. Uh, crises like built into it but that we can actually take politics in our own hands it doesn't have to be this way that it, it's just constant uh crisis like we could plan an economy that works very differently mm -hmm. so okay so you have a, a chapter on pathways to degrowth um and some of the things you propose include everything from you know caps on income and wealth to universal basic income, to, you know, building more cooperative businesses, to reaching out to Global South movements and building alliances there. Um, and it's a mix of things that are more like bottom-up grassroots uh, things that we can sort of do outside of the state, and also policies that um, would probably have to be implemented by a government, um, but would be really helpful. Uh, and so what, what's the relationship between these two types of, um, and if there, if you want to make even more distinctions, um, between the different types of, of steps that we can take toward degrowth, um, and of those steps, kind of what are, you know, either, again, there's many in the book, but which are you either most excited about or that you think are kind of most, most essential? Yeah. So very briefly in the book, we talk about um, three kinds of political strategies that could make degrowth a reality. Um, and here we draw from Eric Olin Wright in his book, um, uh, How to Be an Anti-Capitalist Today, I think. Um, and we kind of have three different strategies. One is um, what we call non-reformist reforms, which are strategies that seem kind of like political poli policies that seem like they're just a reform, but actually they do much more than that. They kind of pave the way to new possibilities. Um, and then we have Nautopias, which, you know, you have the word utopia, but it's utopias that exist in the here and now. Um, so, for example, you have... Uh, worker cooperatives, so uh, a company that's owned by its own workers, or you could have um, 
co-housing systems where people own um, their housing and share it, um, or uh, um, cooperative energy where communities own the, the renewable energy that they themselves produce. So these are things that exist in the here and now, and we don't argue that these are good in themselves necessarily, though they, they do help. What we argue is that by practicing these kinds of um, totally different ways of doing things, people kind of get a feel for what is possible. And then that creates a desire for change. So when you have a moment of, of like decision making where all of a sudden uh, it's possible to make really large changes, people will say, well, we've had this experience of, of this Nautopia. Why isn't the whole economy like that? Um, so Nautopias are kind of like we talk about it as an education of desire. Um, and then the third one is, is ruptural strategies or, or counter hegemonic strategies, which are both around through education, through political intervention, like reshaping the ideology of, of capitalism, of growth, um, but also about basically social movements taking over the streets, blocking profits through a, a union a labor strike or blocking pipelines. Um, these are strategies that kind of are, that we argue are absolutely necessary to make um, degrowth possible because it kind of holds uh, politicians' feet to the fire. Um, and so these three different strategies um, have their own characteristics and they overlap quite a bit, um, but they also kind of reinforce each other. So policies can help more nautopias, uh, ruptural strategies can enforce uh, politicians to put in place uh, policies, but they can also kind of, and nautopias can also inform uh, social movements um, to think differently and um, to provide resources for social movements. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you 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 point out um, that these these three prongs of of attack are are not necessarily going to come from one big movement that is all under the banner of we are the degrowth movement. Um, it'll be a combination of environmentalist movements, feminist movements, socialist movements, um, you know, housing justice movements, and many others. Um, so in this, in this moment of, um, obviously it, it can feel, it can feel to me, I should say that my, my ideological convictions are, 100% for degrowth, um, for an eco-socialism from below. Um, and I look at something like climate change and I say, all right, you know, I think, gosh, we, we really need to start um, reducing emissions as quickly as possible. Um, you know, <laughs> ideally starting 20 years ago, but if not, then tomorrow. Um, and I worry, do, do we have time to overthrow something so entrenched, uh, seemingly anyway, and uh, as the growth paradigm, like, would it be quicker to just hold our noses and try to do the best we can within capitalism, and within growth, something that, you know, could actually pass. But then on the, you know, on the other hand, it's also kind of what we were talking about earlier, even if we tried that would it actually work? Um, because part of the critique of capitalism and growth is that they're distinctly bad at dealing with environmental issues. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, um, if I have like a super specific question there, but just kind of how you navigate moving forward in a time of crisis, um, you know, with a, a movement that is growing and exciting, um, but that still isn't, isn't mainstream yet. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so the first thing I would say to that is, as we say, almost, I think it's the last sentence of the book. We say, you know, we acknowledge that we 
degrowth isn't everything. Like you don't need to call your movement the degrowth movement. Um, what we are arguing for is that there's a lot of discussions that have happened within the degrowth movement and that degrowth proponents have advocated for and have pushed for that are really important and that need to be integrated into a left analysis um, and need to be integrated to uh, left proposals like the Green New Deal. Um, so can, like, then there's also this question of, okay, we're in this really terrible situation. It feels like it's just like, before we've even wrapped a head, our head around one crisis, like another is like blown itself into the world. Um, how can we overcome this? Do we even have the power? Um, mm -hmm. And degrowth explicitly is, has always been about like a, a sense of utopianism. And that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, uh, you know, something that's unreachable, but it's about absolutely we can um, make change happen and we can act on uh, our principles and towards a better, better world. Um, and part of that is, is, is the breeding of desire for change. Um, and so I, I think that's something I take away from the degrowth movement is that no matter what, um, it's important to have a desire for change and to encourage that in others. And then the question is of, is degrowth necessary? Like if, if we're like, okay, well, that's kind of like really high up there as a thing we want to do. Um, but let's just go for the low hanging fruit and, you know, just try to import as much solar panels from China and, um, you know, switch everything we can to renewables. And uh, maybe then we'll figure out uh, the growth thing later. Um, but what we're arguing is that, no, like, we can't do one without the other. Like, if, if, if we only rely on a, uh, if we don't take a growth critical perspective, we're going to repeat the same kinds of dynamics as, as you could see in, in kind of the Soviet communist era, where they just took on the capitalist dynamic of growth as a way to compete with capitalism, but at the same time, it led to, uh, you know, huge ramifications and an eventual collapse. So we need to actually think of uh, degrowth as not necessarily like, we don't need political parties to be, call themselves the degrowth party or anything like that, but we need to integrate that with proposals. Um, and then something I like about these three this three-pronged strategy that I, I mentioned is like whatever we do, first of all, like, uh, you know, I've in some workshops, I've been doing this exercise where we show this three-pronged strategy and then people place what they're up to in that three-pronged strategy. And mm. it's often really hopeful. It's like, oh, like I'm right in the middle or um, I do all of them or I really love the Nautopias. Like that's what I'm about. So it's like, oh, this is something that helps people think about um, how they can act without losing hope. But also, like, each of those strategies, you don't have to do all of them. You don't have to be on every single front line. You can focus on the thing that is, is the most appealing to you. And wherever you're at, like, you're part of something and you can make change happen. So, for example... Um, an example that we give in the book is how these strategies become effective in moments of crisis. Um, so let's say um, like one example we gave was um, this organization Casa Pueblo in Puerto Rico, where in uh, Hurricane Maria, which devastated the island, um, Casa Pueblo, which is this community organization, had set up solar panels a decade ago to power their community center. And when the power failed, everyone was showing up at Casa Pueblo in, in the city of Ajuntas. And Casa Pueblo is, it's, it, it, it's a radio station, it's community run, it's run according to democratic principles. And so in that crisis, 
that's where people picked up their water. That's where people charged their phones when they needed to call their family. So you have this nowtopia that all of a sudden becomes the main way that people think about the change that they want to see in the future. Um, so even if you're like with three friends, you decide to start like uh, uh, you decided to start a mutual aid organization uh, distributing food during the pandemic, like that can make a really big change when crisis happens because you'll be prepared and, and you'll have the tools to um, um, to make a change. But also, if you're there, that kind of model is the thing that people look at when they start rebuilding. Um, so now um, there's this huge movement, even though Puerto Rico was hit by really massive privatization of the energy sector, there's this huge movement to put solar panels onto every hospital and community center. And, mm. um, and also, uh, Casa Pueblo really influenced the kind of anti-corruption movement uprising that in Puerto Rico two years later. So it, those little things can actually go really far. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, um, I think in our book, you know, it's called the future of is degrowth. And, um, we wanted to be, make it really hopeful. Um, because I think there's actually a lot of little things that we can participate in and those little things can go a, a really long way. Thanks. Yeah. I think that's a really inspiring note to end, um, kind of this portion of the conversation. If you don't mind, I have one more question. That's a bit of a change of pace. Um, which is that, um, regular listeners to this podcast might remember an interview I did a couple months ago, um, with. Dylan Harris, who is an editor of a project called Not Afraid of the Ruins, um, which is a collection of uh, short ecological fiction, short stories um, that, yeah, in different ways deal with different climate environmental issues. Um, and Aaron, too, is an editor of that project and also wrote a story for it. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier in the conversation uh, the William Morris book, News from Nowhere, which is, is an 1890 utopian fiction book. Um, I know at least some of the uh, some of the stories in Not Afraid of the Ruins are are utopian or optimistic in in some way. And so, what what role does fiction play for you in um, yeah, in, in in kind of looking ahead to a better world or, or making sense of what, what this world is going through now. Yeah. I mean, I think it has a really, really huge role to play that I'm constantly kind of shaken by. Um, if, if you think of the response to squid game um, and, and a lot of these science fiction kind of um, critiques of, of capitalism um, and critique critiques of like modern society they the, their massive popularity speaks to something about how um people are really identify with science fiction not because it's out there it's utopian it's um it's something that is an escape but because it allows them it allows people to like co comprehend um, their own reality and their, their own moment that mm. we live in. Um, and, and also it, it helps with this kind of, um, breeding of desire of, of, whoa, things could be different. Um, so I personally, I'm like hugely inspired by, by writers like, um, Ursula Le Guin and Octavia Butler. And, um, I basically as like, just like a personal note, as I'm, uh, I finished my PhD last year, and as I'm thinking of other things to do in my life, um, I'm like, basically, I just want to uh, focus on science fiction and science fiction writing. Um, oh, cool. And that's kind of like what I'm shifting to right now. Um, just because like, <laughs> 
I find it the ac academia is increasingly precarious and um, journalism is something else that I have always enjoyed but find really difficult um, to make a living in. And not that writing is any better, but at least I'll be, I'll be doing exactly what I feels good um, <laughs> to me. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exciting. I look forward to reading your stuff. And uh, is there anything else on any of this you want to add? Um, yeah. Um, I, I guess one thing was um, when we talked about the criticism of degrowth, you know, people also criticize degrowth for being utopian, um, mm. which, which isn't, you know, I think initially people have this reaction of like, oh, you want, you're against progress. Um, you're, you, you want to go back to the caves. Mm -hmm. um, but then when people, you're like, well, no, degrowth is about all these policies. Then they're like, well, okay, you're being utopian and using that as a bad word. Um, and in our book, we, in the last half of the book, we argue that um, not only is degrowth desirable, um, it's also achievable. Um, and we try to argue that it's a utopia that is practical and something that um, could help people think about a different way of doing things. Cool. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, thanks, Aaron, for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Dayton, for the invitation. All right. Once again, the book is The Future is Degrowth uh, by Matthias Meltzer, Aaron Vansingen, and Andrea Vetter. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you can get the book now. If you're not listening to this podcast, you can also get the book now, but might not know it. Um, there's a link to more about the book in the episode description. It covers a lot of the topics we talked about today um, in more detail with some more specifics in some of them. Um, expanded, obviously, because it's a whole book, not just an interview. Um, yeah, if you're interested in this stuff, it's worth reading. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider signing up for my newsletter. Uh, it's once a week. It's free. Um, what a deal. Uh, and you get podcast updates. Uh, and if you really enjoyed it, please consider sharing this podcast with a friend, helping spread the word, uh, or even supporting financially um, by making a monthly uh, contribution on patreon.com slash storytellingpod. Uh, thanks so much. Have a good day.